Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I wanted to do a video today about relational blind spots as they relate to our childhood trauma. These blind spots come up in all kinds of relationships, romantic partnerships, friendships, family, even relationships with, with coworkers. And what do I mean by a relational blind spot is simply meaning that the way that we relate to people. When we grow up in abuse and when we grow up in childhood trauma, we grow up into adults who struggle with having some tunnel vision in the way that we perceive ourselves and the way that we perceive others. We don't see the whole picture. The most common one that I think of for trauma survivors, and I'm sure you guys will relate to this, is simply um, choosing bad partners simply because they express interest in us. Um, it's almost like the concept of love bombing or something like that, that the tunnel vision is about not seeing the whole picture or who the whole person is because our inner child is desperate to be accepted or desperate to be in a relationship. And that sort of that inner child, you know, those issues, they overdrive our built in self protection radar that got damaged in childhood. And we can't really sort of, that radar is there to really determine whether somebody is healthy for us or not. So we gotta get that radar back online. And this video is gonna be kind of a component of that. If you struggle with all that stuff, you can check out a video that I did about dating, um, sort of with having been raised in childhood trauma, and you can find the video either up here or up there. And I'm gonna be getting into that very specific issue later in the video about choosing bad people. Um, we also have other types of different blind spots that I'm also gonna be covering as well. There are, there are three of them in this video. If you're new to me or new to the channel, welcome. I'm Patrick Tian. I'm a licensed clinical therapist specializing in childhood trauma and the abusive family system. If you like this video at the end, you can hit some buttons on the screen you can't miss with any of the buttons. If you find that these videos are helpful to you and your recovery, you can support the work that goes into this channel over at my Patreon. And I don't have any third parties um, like sort of like promotions or anything like that from other sort of companies on this on this channel because I find it mucks things up for the viewer and I don't do any merch or any of that jazz. So that being said, you can also check out my website and find childhood trauma therapy e-course work. If you're interested in doing that, there's a link to that in the little bubble up here. And that my, you can also connect with me via my website. You can also connect with me via my Instagram and you can also connect with me via TikTok. And I'll have all the links in the description below in this video. So here we go. I'm gonna talk about three types of relational blind spots that childhood trauma survivors have. I see this a lot in my practice. I see this a lot in my own recovery. And I'm gonna be going over th uh, the following items for each of those three that I'll be talking about. If you wanna take some notes or prep your journal in some way, here are the four items that I'm gonna get into. What the blind spot looks like, no pun intended, <laughs> so it's a blind spot, how would you know? Um, that's the first one. The second one, why it's not good for you. The third one is why you struggle with it, like getting into some family history ideas. And also the fourth one is how to work on that issue. So let's dive into it. The first one on the list related to what I said earlier is not fully recognizing toxicity in others as a blind spot. This one does not just apply to romantic partnerships. It can be bosses, friends, coworkers, even family, even strangers. Um, like it, like the mailman or the person who cuts your hair. Before doing my, my childhood trauma work, I was somehow always the last person to know that a coworker was either really super sketchy or abusive to other people or something like that. Or even I was always the last to know in my friend circles that someone was sort of acting out. And when I'd find out, I'd be like baffled that that reality, meaning that it was a sign that I missed major things about people um, up front when other people would catch it. What this blind spot looks like, it looks like um, you're dating someone and at five months or even after the first year or something like that, like, oops, they have a sex addiction oops, they never have really fully broken up with their ex, or oops, they have massive secrets. And I'm not blaming you as these, are, these examples are being in a relationship with someone who's incredibly dishonest, but I have clients when they're in that, I have them reflect back on how the relationship started. What were those dynamics about how the relationship started to explore any mis many any misread flags that could have been prevalent to them that because they were in their inner child at the time they missed so this is what this blind spot is about 
Other examples, let's just say you have a difficult boss or a difficult coworker, but you struggle with knowing where the line is. Uh, about is it really that toxic like the boss can be awful or really off but you never quite know if it's healthy unless someone says like oh my god you know your boss sounds like a nightmare um, and why can they see it so clearly up front when we can't how can they make that judgment on unhealthy behavior so easily when you can't you might have a friend who is super moody or lashes out or is super critical of you and you might be in a role of taking care of them or um, it's, it's, you know, like your, your actions for them are sort of never enough and the blind spot in that scenario is something like being too comfortable with a one-way street relationship and you might struggle with big feelings of guilt about being mad at them and never fully taking in how awful they are or how difficult they are to deal with because of that guilt. And sometimes a toxic person can be, you know, at times randomly fun and randomly like wonderful, but it's so inconsistent, it's confusing. That tells you something um, that it's such a hot and cold relationship and that can be very familiar to us depending on uh, your childhood. A lot of childhood abuse or the childhood trauma stuff is around having a parent who's very inconsistent where they have one good day out of the month and then we chase that connection with them and we don't see the other 29 days of just sort of misery. So here's why this is not good for you, not being able to see toxicity. I think whether it's a partner or a friend or a boss, there is usually constant internal wrestling with ourselves between feeling awful about the toxic behavior, like we kind of know something's off, um, the behavior that the person does, and then switching into like an internal, but, but, but what if I'm wrong? But what if I'm mean? Or what if I'm not understanding enough? Like that's a huge one, um, probably related to our trauma as well. And what I'm getting at is that we very much second guess ourselves when these sort of appropriate feelings come up when we're dealing with someone who's super difficult. Second guessing ourselves is a major roadblock to our recovery and self-esteem. It keeps us small and it's too familiar to be treated like crap and a big part of us assumes that that's normal or worse, we assume that it's no big deal when it is. Or who are we to complain that you, your boss maybe overshared with you about their divorce in their office after throwing you under the bus in sort of a meeting? You see that high level of sort of toxicity and like where, where are we? And that as trauma survivors, we're very much confused by that. And a sign of health is when we can just kind of call it for what it is, just to kind of like perceive it as it is and not second guess ourselves. Um, blind spots about toxicity in others can get us into a lot of trouble especially romantically, um, or we take on a moody friendship that becomes exhausting and never ending and a never good enough kind of endeavor that keeps us in a triggered state. This is why it's not good for us. The biggest reason why these situations are not good for us is these dynamics keep our systems triggered and activated, which is bad for our bodies and minds and keep us stuck. Like, let's just say hypothetically, um, for those of you that might have had a bad roommate and just like it's when you go home having a bad roommate It's a lot like going home in middle school that you're going to be in trouble with the person or it's just such a like a grind with that person or There's even a lot of like fear and anxiety about it We're used to that and then when the roommate moves out That's when you sort of notice it's just like this like your body hopefully might kind of calm down a little bit but it's a little bit like that frog in the water analogy. We're so used to this stuff. So when we dial into it, I, it's just gonna sound weird, but in my work with my clients, I tell them when we start to do some work, my job is to lessen their tolerance for toxicity because we're talking about the, the family system growing up. We're talking about the issues and we're talking about the triggers. And while that's hard to get to that place, that's a sign of progress when you can't deal with the toxic boss or you can no longer deal with the toxic friend because it's sort of like your feelings are telling you the right things. So that's what I mean by that. So moving on, why do we struggle with this, not seeing toxicity in others? Let's get into some family history. Here are some questions to help you explore. Did you grow up with a moody, reactive, or volatile parents? Were your parents difficult people? 
Did you not have any safe adults to help you with your family's toxic dynamics or behaviors? None of us did. Um, but if you answer no to this one, you didn't have any frame of reference for how bad it was or what was healthy or what was not. And a toxic boss might be super familiar to you because of those reasons. Were you taught to put your feelings away and that others come first? Maybe another part of this. Do you have attachment wounds that create a pull to a certain type of difficult or unavailable partner? You can also check out any of my role play videos to explore what type of parent sort of conflict you had or the type of personality you may have had in a parent and that might lead to some insight about why you struggle with these things. Um, about why we don't have a radar. It's easier to see it in, in, a, in like a third party video like that than it would be to be on the call with your mom or your dad. So moving on, here's how to work on this one. This is involved, so it's just, um, I'm gonna flash a, a graphic on the screen. Let's just call this a missing red flag inventory. I'm taking this from the tradition of 12-step work about inventory work. That's where this idea came to me. So first is you create a list of difficult or toxic people that have been in your life. Bosses, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever, friendships, family members, maybe not family members. Um, that or that simply people in your history that you would that would they would push buttons in you you create this list as the first column and in a second column you define the toxic behavior that that person had lying refused to own anything acted superior to you was manipulative it was always a one-way street they always blamed you they kept huge secrets um, or that they needed you to take care of them whatever that is try to write that down um, or were they really like likable, but they were also a total mess. That's sort of another sort of, that's actually a behavior. Um, and look for the patterns. You will see repetitions in how these people behave because it's gonna be unique to you. In the third column, what did you want from the person while you were in this relationship? Did you want recognition? Did you want fairness? Did you want approval? Did you want their sole attention? Did you want like re um, reciprocal generosity? Um, did you want to get through to them on something? That's a big one for childhood trauma. Um, to take care of them or did you simply just want to be seen and good as valuable? Are those things bad and unto themselves? No, but they're probably unique to your history related to the next column. The fourth column is, was the stuff that you listed in the third column missing in your childhood from your parents? Examples like you may have tried to take care of your toxic boss just like you tried to take care of your father's emotional MS. Those are the kind of um, sort of patterns that we're looking for. And lastly, I know there's a lot of columns. Um, the fifth column is um, what was a red flag that you didn't catch in the beginning of the relationship? Like how the boss treated another coworker on your first day? how they overshared, how the partner was super vague about their ex in the first months of the relationship, how the friend always had you come to them in the beginning of the relationship, which sets a precedent, that kind of stuff. And I know that that's a lot of columns, but it's important to know what the patterns are and what your inner child is trying to do there. And the most important probably column there is what you wanted from the person and think about how is that related to the missing sort of parenting or connectivity or whatever that was missing in your childhood from people. So the takeaway here is that when these relationships starts, there is a part of you that most likely sees the dysfunction, some small conscious part of you. And if you do this, you'd be surprised how much you actually can recall. Like you had that roommate that you interviewed and they just had that weird twinge <laughs> of something going on. And you know, or, or maybe not, it might be really sort of hard to figure that out. And don't take that as sort of blaming you for, for not getting things. Sometimes humans are super shady and you miss it. But again, we're thinking about what the inner child does that we kind of go into a tunnel vision mode and don't see this stuff. And, um, and it might be very helpful to figure out why those patterns can help you prevent it from happening again. At the heart of this one is that the wound, wounded inner children do not see toxicity up front because we need to be liked, we need the thing to just work, we might idolize the person, and shame tells us to not trust our gut, and shame tells us that we are bad for not tolerating difficult people better. 
or that the wounded inner child thinks that a toxic person um, has the ability to make better choices when we don't see that they actually can't. Um, the inner child keeps codependently trying with people that in thinking that the person has the capacity to make better choices or be a better person to them. And that's really wrapped up, I think, in not giving up on our abusive parents, which is a huge issue in our recovery, if not the last thing to go in healing is grieving and letting our parents go. And giving. what I mean by that is giving up on the potential of somebody and hopefully that resonates with you because that's what I'm trying to express. So, so moving on, the second blind spot is being too hard or not hard enough on others. This blind spot is rooted in anger and shame. And I find that childhood trauma survivors are wired as either being too hard on other people, like not seeing someone's full humanity, or holding people up to really unfair expectations and standards, or we're not hard enough on people. And yes, I'm being literal about not being hard enough. I know that that's like a hard phrase, but that's literally what I mean. Um, where we're not standing up for ourselves or we're not standing up for an issue that we lose our voice or we give away our power or we simply lose the right to be upset, which is a big one. And we, we when, when we're not being treated well or people keep crossing boundaries with us and we're not loud enough or assertive enough about them or we don't exit the relationship. We need that ability in life. And sometimes it means that ability means to be hard on other people. You know, um, I think trauma survivors who are wired that way, we want a very graceful experience and have the person get it about you're not crossing, you know, you're not paying attention to my boundary. Um, and that's, it's just never really kind of works. I think the inner child sort of has a fantasy about I don't want to be mean, they must have the ability to get it. So that's what I mean by that. And you can be a combination of both those things depending on the person and depending on the situation. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, when we are not hard enough on people, we enable or we give the other person too much power over the situation or the relationship. The person who is not hard enough on others has lost their justifiable, justifiable upset as a way to get out of the conflict. And I work with them to try to jumpstart that, you know, upset, like jumpstarting a dead battery, um, to get to the fairness around, to get to the anger around the unfairness. But all of that wasn't safe for them growing up. So it's a very foreign experience and it takes quite a while to get somebody to sort of embrace their own anger. And anger is not bad in any way. I think it's the way that we use anger. Anger is just a natural emotion and it's a compass for us, I think. So a side note, both of these types are codependent not just the one who isn't hard enough on the other. And I can, it's on my list. I have a, a whole other video being planned about um, the huge umbrella term about codependency. But what I mean there is, you know, both styles can be codependent in a way that they kind of have an agenda going on. And there's many different, def different definitions to codependencies, but it's not just the one who shuts down or doesn't hold people accountable. So here's the best way to show you guys what this looks like. Let's look at an infographic about these two types of trauma survivors. And you can identify with either of these or both. So what I mean about the person who isn't hard enough on people tends to shut down. Their trigger energy goes down, meaning that they shut down, they become compliant, they may cry silently or quietly, like in a restricted affect. They may lose their words, they lose their voice, they go a little bit numb, and they may seem aloof to the other person. And you know, at the little note I have, it's a primal defense, it's like the fawning defense. So that's the person who isn't hard enough on people. So because they're in a trauma reaction, and they need to do some work to sort of jumpstart their ability to use their words. I do this in my group work to get somebody to be able to stay on sort of a tightrope and not be all the trigger, but be conscious of the trigger and still be able to hold on to their expression. So, and then on the other side is the trigger energy that goes up. This is the person who is too hard on people. They go into what I call lawyer mode. They are more aggressive. They are really good at building a case for how the other person is bad, sharp words, they can't take it, they are visibly mad. And up top there, they have a cerebral, they're a fighter. It's a really a classic kind of fight defense. 
And that is sort of spelling out the person who is being too hard on others. You can sort of see this um, in all kinds of scenarios. So what's the blind spot in those two types of conflict styles? You can check out this role play that I did about a couple session where one person is going into this lawyer mode, their energy is going up, and they have a blind spot and thinks that their partner who is shutting down is just choosing to leave the conversation or that they're being superior by being aloof. And the person who shuts down is assuming that the other person is right or that they have the right to talk like that because they can't have the ability to get loud or they simply assume that they're not gonna win so they just kind of like weather the storm. And this is an over the top trauma reaction. The person whose energy goes up is assuming that they have to get loud to get through and they assume that a well-argued airtight case and proof matters most. Um, they're defending against in a very sort of fighty way. It's sort of a not today Satan kind of energy that is very self-righteous. This is also an over-the-top trauma reaction. When you watch the video, you probably more feel sympathy for the person who's shutting down, but both people are at fault. You could summarize that these two styles as either make it okay, like the person who's not hard enough on other people, their style is, I gotta make this okay. And the other person is sort of make them pay. The person who is hard on people, they have kind of have a punishing element to themselves. So, you know, you'll see what I mean in that video. Both parties are in their inner child where one's energy is about being way too hard on the other and the other's energy is about being shut down and has lost their justifiable upset about the angry one's self-righteous, not about sort of the dishes, you know? Um, and you might have this going on with your family or coworkers or friendships or long-term relationships, especially romantic partnerships. As a side note, trauma survivors are often paired with their opposite. And it's very common to have clients and relationships with their opposite. What I mean is that um, if you tend to like go into lawyer mode, you might be paired with a lot of people who shut down. And if you sort of are, don't really, if you're not hard enough on other people, you might find people who can get like big with you to replicate mom and dad sort of situations from growing up. So why this isn't good? Well. When we are too hard on people and we put all that well of childhood trauma pain on others, we, we get to be superior, we get to control the intimacy, which is a big issue, and we keep ourselves safe by being superior. And our message about the issues gets lost in our trigger tone, which is usually wrapped up in being disgusted with the other person, being critical and unloving. It's gonna be related to the family stuff. When we aren't hard enough on people, we enable, we live in the fear, we codependently create a cycle, and the worst part is we don't know what we have the we don't know that we have the right to be upset and coming back to that natural compass that that we, we lose what that compass is telling us what to do. We don't claim our self-respect or show others that we are an equal and we have, we have the right to the space and the conflict. Both of these are ways to control intimacy. Inner children do that and they're like little ninjas with controlling intimacy. Little ninjas in terms of getting out of intimacy. They are good at getting out of it. The angry one gets to be distant and superior and the not upset one controls the intimacy by giving all their power away. That's still control. Um, here is why you might struggle with it, some family history stuff. So for my clients who are too hard on other people, I work with them about how their abuse might be wrapped up in being consistently let down growing up, having highly immature parents who couldn't get it together, or worse, parents who were avoidant and didn't stand up for themselves. You see the pattern there? And usually the person who is hard on others is upset by the other person's perceived weakness. We see a lot of this in society. They may also have grown up in a system where it was perfectly fine to lose it on someone, or the family saw shaming almost like as a recreational activity to do with each other in the system. The person who is not hard, um, the person who is hard on others is also fighting with the wrong person. I redirect them back to the end and redirect that energy back to their family system of origin about who let you down, who would leave the conversation kind of stuff. For clients who are not hard enough on people, I work with them about being probably overwhelmed by a toxic parent or being blamed and shamed directly. They were never, they were probably never allowed to be upset and most likely 
had a dominating or very shaming parental system. They might have been scapegoated. They can also just, it can also just stem from neglect where there was no connection and no protection. So this person may bond with authority figures. They may bond with people who can sort of tell them sort of the what for, I guess. So, so the fourth item is how to work on this one. When a conflict or a situation comes up, after your trigger dies down, you can r sort of ask yourself some of the following questions. For those of you who are too hard on others, you can ask, did all that energy I had with my partner or friend belong to them? Did some of it or all of it maybe belong to one or both of my parents? What was I really upset about? Don't just keep focusing on the dishes or them being late. Did the, you know, the, were you upset about the person not showing up to the fight? Were you upset about the person seeming dishonest? Were you feeling taken advantage of? Um, and is that really, really true? Um, how is this similar to growing up, like maybe being parentified, like where you have to drive everything? Was all that really that important? And lastly, how do I feel about myself when I go into that mode, when I go into that energy? And I, I trigger, this is the most triggering, you know, the triggering business is tricky because there is a present piece to things, but for childhood trauma survivors, it's mostly about our past. Like the partner not doing the dishes again, um, does it really, you know, yes, that's a pain in the ass and that's a big issue about fairness in the relationship and all kinds of stuff. So I'm trying to validate in the present there is sort of a piece. But the way that we react to it, the, all of that energy, all of that triggered energy keeps us stuck and is not good for it. So that's what I mean about the nature of those questions. So moving on, for those who are not hard enough to ask, what is my fear or belief about speaking up or using my voice? Is that fear true? Um, that they maybe they would break up with you or that maybe you'd get sort of hurt in some way if you spoke up. Does all the fear of speaking up belong to the present or to the person? Does it belong to some of your childhood stuff? What would happen in your family if you used your voice? And then like the other one is, how do I feel about myself when I shut down and lose my voice and can't sort of engage in the conversation? So. That's that. Moving on, the third and the last one is not seeing that others are triggered too. What this looks like is, I think as trauma survivors, we assume we're the only person in the room, workplace or relationship that has issues. That's so not true. And you might have grown, you might have grown out of that by now, but your inner child can still sort of believe in that. And here's what I mean. This one's really related to the last one, by the way. So some examples. You go to that moody friend with a problem and they really zing you with contempt and criticism. And you leave ashamed that they might be right and you missed a lot of their behavior. Another blind spot. Your boss is super inconsistent. One minute they share too much, the next they lecture, the next they are really awkward and off in a meeting with you. or. Um, you feel confused and bad, but you second guess yourself because, you know, well, they were they were nice to me on Tuesday. They were intimate with me on Tuesday and that, you know, the mess of all that. Um, you This is a big one. You go to a sibling about a dysfunctional parent and they half acknowledge, but they partly defend the parent and you leave feeling abandoned and blamed or maybe ashamed of yourself for bringing it up. Um, we get self-consumed by our own trauma and we miss the bigger picture about what is going on in others in the conflict or the situation. We miss that our moody friend is self-righteous and blamey, which is a major telltale sign of being triggered. They might have been triggered about mistaking your vulnerability for weakness, which is something I see all the time, especially in social media and or in society right now, and we miss that those are signals of childhood tra trauma in them. The boss, because because they're an authority figure or they were intimate or you know shared something or sweet one minute and then in a super cold manager mode the next, we miss that they are inconsistent as a leader and they're messy about boundaries, which is another sign of that they're triggered and potentially have some trauma, some childhood trauma of their own. With the sibling, um, they're playing devil's advocate, which in this case is their codependency about not taking a side. Not taking a side is another potential sign of being triggered or having childhood trauma symptoms, like the belief that um, no one can be bad. 
Um, I can't tolerate that, but I'm happy to judge you and abandon you in needing me to be an ally. See what I'm sort of saying there is that their choice to not sort of really acknowledge, or their blind spot to not acknowledge the, the parental system being toxic is their own sort of codependency, one of their own trauma, trauma symptoms. But we might walk away feeling that that sibling might know better when we're starting this stuff. So why this isn't good, why not seeing that other people are triggered um, too isn't good is thinking it's always you or thinking you're the only one who is upset or triggered isn't good because it confirms for our inner child our worst fears and it's just like our family. Um, it's not good because we make up stories. Maybe the boss is just having a bad day and isn't toxic. Maybe my friend is giving me tough love because I'm always the mess. Maybe my sibling is the real expert on the whole family system and I'm just a selfish jerk. You see how those thoughts aren't good for you. Um, and here is why we struggle with it, some family history. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you're the only person in your family who is questioning the system. If you have a sibling or cousin that gets it, that's such a gift and you're in the tiniest of minorities. And that being said, our childhoods are usually very lonely experiences where no one is real about what's going on and therefore we second guess reality all the time. We also grow up with things like gaslighting parents or passive aggressive parents where the communication up top never matches the situation below and we're always told we got it wrong. Like the classic passive aggressive like I'm not upset, you know, like what is said up top like in text, I'm not upset, but all of that confusing emotion beneath it, I think it's called meta communication. like what is said up top, what is said below, none of that stuff matches up. And I grew up confused all the time. I, had, I didn't know if I was coming or going in childhood because my parents, were they were just so not in reality. So all childhood trauma is trauma around the child's perception. So we become kind of siloed or we grow up in a vacuum, always thinking it's us and not having um, healthy people to bounce things off of. Um, if you grew up being told that water isn't wet and it's your fault that dad drinks or don't be so sensitive, all that stuff gives us the core belief that we're the most messed up one in the room or in the family or in the relationship when that's not true. But that's what our reality was back then. So it's really a shifting gears out of a lot of conditioning. Our body is just, you know, um, waiting to be called out again for being the most messed up one. And even I even think about if you struggle with imposter syndrome, that might be a clue to why you struggle with it because the work environment just becomes like your family system again where you're just gonna get clobbered or found out at any given moment because the family lived in an alternate reality. I hope that that makes sense. So on this one, the last one, how to work on it, you can check out a video that I did about what it means to be triggered somewhere up here or up here. Um, and exploring your own triggers is a concrete list about what it looks like to be triggered, but also thinking about how others might be exhibiting signs off that list. Um, and it's start to see people in a, in a different way. Like in that last example in number two, try to identify lawyer mode in others. Try to identify people shutting down. Is the barista or the waiter who seems despondent or rude to you, are they triggered and it's not about you? Um, just jump on any social media and you'll see lots of video videos, I mean, lots of comments or videos about people being in lawyer mode all the time. It's like rampant and, um, and behaving in very self-righteous ways. So let's say you have a, a super, this is an odd analogy. Let's say you have a super positive coworker who never seems upset and they work way more than they should and they, get, they might get treated terribly or they may never get recognized, but nothing phases them. Every day is amazing to them and it's kind of tough to watch. And it seems like the ideal employee, but someone like that, they might live in a 24 seven trigger around codependency, perfectionism, and shame. But to you, you might perceive that you should be like them. And that's what I mean in the, in the beginning of the video when I was, I was always the last to know. 
um, I was I was really terrible at reading people because of my childhood trauma, and that's what I mean about this one. So this this hypothetical coworker is you know you can feel shame that you're not that positive or you're not that into the job or that you're not that you know sort of whatever. And as a side note, I, I really mean if that coworker feels inauthentic. I'm not attacking people who are positive. I think that that's it's great to have a good attitude and stuff. But I think that the issue is whether about whether that positivity is authentic or not. Um, have you ever met somebody who is like like painfully optimistic? Um, they might be triggered out of their minds and repressing huge, emo huge emotions, or they might be using the optimism. It's almost like a spiritual bypass to ignore huge feelings. And they're kind of in a head trip. So how to work on this one is to reflect and recognize triggers in others as opposed to assuming it's always you. Um, this is, you know, this is just for you and your awareness. It's not good to ask people, like it's not good to ask that coworker like, hey, are you triggered all the time? You know, that really never goes well unless you have context and more of, a, of an intimacy with them. Um, and you know, it's when when it, when it's safe, it doesn't become such a loaded question. Um, I think it's better to sort of if you you know, it's never ask somebody if they're triggered. <laughs> it always goes it probably always goes wrong. Um, but you can sort of you might want to say something like you know, hey, well, I wonder what happened for you there, as a more sort of softer way to kind of figure that out. So to work on this one. There's this old quote, and it's debated about who came up with the quote. And it's usually about our own behaviors to exploring our own behaviors, but you can use it to look at others. That quote of, is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And I'm gonna add one, a funny one. I'm gonna add, were they extra? I love that phrase because it addresses a vibe in a person that we might ignore, but it's a clue that the person might have some triggered energy going on. Like if I started this video and I was like, Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, read the comments. You know, you could, <laughs> you can, you can get a sense that there is some kind of energy going on with me. I might be trying to prove something, or I might be afraid, or I might, you know, really be trying to seem like cool or try to get through something. And that's a clue to feel that there might be something going on for the person that they might be triggered. And just the definition of triggered is in the, where we're just anything more then a little bit upset means to be triggered or activated or in our inner child or in a little bit of our trauma brain. Um, and I think being authentic is a sign that the person is not triggered, that there's an easiness about them, that there's sort of, they don't nothing to hide, nothing to defend kind of a thing. It's kind of a hard thing to describe. So how to use that quote? Is it true that my sibling deals with mom better? Or are they avoiding uncomfortable feelings? Were they being extra in that phone conversation with me? Was it necessary for my friend to dump criticism on me like that when it came out of nowhere? Or that was it an opportunity to them to lash out and be superior to me? Were they being extra? Was it kind of my boss to switch gears so abruptly like that? I went from a friend of theirs to like a customer service rep all in a day. Were they being extra? So that's what I mean about those self-reflective questions. It's hard to do when you're triggered. So when the trigger dies down to think about what really happened there, what were some signs to go over it? Because you might, if you don't do that, you might just have a story that the brother was right about you, that the friend had the right to like invalidate you or dump on you, or that the boss was just having a bad day. That's what I mean by that. So in this video, I just gave three ideas about relational blind spots. But if you have named others on your own or you're working on them or stuff that you guys see, feel free to put them in the comments. I love that there's a sense of community and sharing ideas and sharing recovery in the comments of these videos. And I hope that this video was helpful to you guys. Up next week is a follow-up video to the validation video that I did. We're gonna be getting into the triggers around giving validation as opposed to receiving it. And I hope that this video was helpful. As always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be joyous. Take care, guys.